we're off to the races. So thanks again for joining me on the podcast. Happy to have you here. Well, thank you very much. Um, I guess by way of introduction, I'm Jack Trimble, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Air Force and retired FedEx pilot. And uh, I started out at a very early age. See, uh, my father was a military pilot. And uh, did World War II in Korea and staff job in Vietnam and uh, flew P-38s in Europe, RB-26s in Korea. <clears throat> and all my life I grew up on Air Force bases. And one of the most formative ones was probably between the age of 9 and 12, actually uh, 7 and 12, I lived at Edwards Air Force Base. Oh. I was there when all of the, uh, the Century Series fighters were getting tested and flown. And the kids wow. I went to school with, their, their moms and dads, and their dads were the ones flying. I lived on what? an area of the bay. Oh, go ahead. I was saying, so your dad was a test pilot, I take it? No, he was a systems project officer there at okay. the time. Uh, T-37, uh, the uh, B-52G. Okay. B fifty eight hustler, and as we were leaving, it was on the B seventy. Wow. But uh, we lived in uh, an area at Edwards. It's called the staff area, and it was on a there was a hill to the south of runway two two that had the general's house on it, and there were eleven houses by it, and that's the only houses around for five miles. And we could look at the runway and look at all the desert. And so uh, it's an amazing place to grow up. I, <clears throat> I watched the initial test drops of the F-15 lying on my back in my backyard with binoculars. Wow. And uh, while I was there in those four years, 23 people died. That's a different age. You know, I go back to, I mean, for me, it's like watching the right stuff. And, you know, when they show up at Edwards, and I assume that's pretty, you know, realistic where someone was house, dying every house, week. The house they used in the right stuff when they were doing the barbecue in the backyard and stuff. That was my house. No kidding. That was the house that I lived in. My dad, you know, planted all that grass out there. And uh, watered it, got it green and stuff, and enjoyed it. But that was the exact house that I lived in. And, you were uh, destined to be a fighter pilot. I mean, you know, if, if you weren't going to be a fighter pilot after all that, then I, I don't know what would make you one. Well, stories get even more, you know, pull up your trousers and your legs, you know. So, let me see. In that neighborhood, there was a guy named Spot Collins who uh, went on to be commander of tactical air command. Uh, our immediate next door neighbor uh, was a guy named Horace A. Haynes. He was a colonel then, my dad's boss at the time. And uh, he went on to be the commander of NORAD. Okay. And two houses down was a guy named Pete Everest. That I used to play with his, uh, his uh, kids, uh, Vicky, Cindy, and Kevin, and Pete Everest for a while was known as the fastest man alive. That's, that is wild to, to have uh, grown up there. And I mean, in that time period, talk about the era of fighter jets and just, I mean, the evolution of aerospace technology in that period is just phenomenal. There was a girl in my, uh, my time as grade school class, you know, Kathy Anderson. Her brother Jim was a year ahead of us and stuff, and that's that's Jim Anderson, the World War II ace, who's uh, 102 years old now. You know, uh, and he's a great guy, by the way. <clears throat> I mean, I'm telling stories more about my childhood than anything. But uh, I I came home from school one day, and and <clears throat> my mother said to me as she went out the door. In a very stern face, she said, there's been a crash. Uh, she said, uh, hey, but your dad's not hurt or anything. And it turns out it, it wasn't my dad that crashed. It was a guy named Clavasso. 
and an F-86 coming home from across country ran out of fuel and belly landed at the far side of the lake there. And my, uh, my dad was up doing uh, camera runs with a, a photographer guy in a T-37. And that was where he belly landed was 25 miles from where the nearest car trucks were. And they were, they were moving, but they were going to be a while. And, uh, my dad saw the smoke and flew over, flew over the guy and the plane was starting to burn. And, uh, he called the tower and said, you know, there's, it looks like it's starting to burn. Is there anything I can do? And the tower said, can you land? So he landed the T-37 on the lake bed, no marks or anything, landed it and taxied up to within about, oh, probably 400 yards and unstrapped, shut it down, got out, and he asked the photographer for the camera. And the guy took the lenses out and gave him the camera and my dad ran over there, got on the wing and smashed the canopy to bring him out no of there. No kidding. The canopy was jammed. So he got him out and stuff like that, and got the soldiers in that for doing that. But no kidding, that's the type of stuff that went on. You know, every day you 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 would be yeah. sitting in class and hear this boom, boom. yeah, somebody slipped through the mock again, again, and four or five <laughs> times. You know, it was it was a great time to be there. I I uh, yeah, it made an impression on me. Uh, well, I was going to say at some point there, I mean, I imagine that was what lit the fire for you to want to go pursue becoming a fighter pilot and career in aviation or where, when did that bug bite you? Uh, ever since my dad glued two sticks together and showed me that they would fly because he loved to yeah. build model airplanes when he was a kid. In the thirties, they built, built them from scratch, you know. And uh, it was something that he showed me that, hey, we can glue these two sticks together and make them wings, and here's how you balance it out so, it, you know, it, it's stable and it would fly. And it was just, you know, and of course, uh, around those type of children, all of them were like that. And we had neighborhood places where, you know, we'd bring out your best little glider and see who could fly it further. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> it was one of these things. I'm, I'm eight years old and found out that my plane does a perfect Immelman. And that's when I learned what an Immelman was. You know, you'd throw it and it would go up and go way up at the top of the loop and then turn over and just glide as far as you can go. <laughs> Gosh, I mean, I'm, well, I'm still kind of reeling over the fact that they just landed and, and bashed a canopy open to get a guy out. But, you know, the time, that error is just so different than what it is today. Those stories, eh, you probably, there's still, it's just a different variation, uh, different technology, different things. But yeah, the safety is a lot better. And I think that's probably, unfortunately, it's all written in blood. Uh, yeah. I'm backyard. curious because I saw you were born at Shaw Air Force Base, or you were born in Sumter, South Carolina. No, which no. I was born. No. At, I was born at McGill Air Force Base. Okay, all right. With well, the bio is slightly different, but it kind of leading back to that era, like World War II and aviation, and all the way up probably through the '60s and '70s, it was not uncommon where, especially World War II, you had a couple crashes a day across the pilot training all the pilot training bases. And that was just a normal occurrence and push the plane off or, you know, keep on going, which is the 50s, much different than losing, today. In the fifties, they were losing about 600 a year. Gosh. Yeah. Two a day. I mean, that, it's, it's wild. Yeah, you know, across the spectrum. I mean, of course it was the whole spectrum, you know, a B 36 would go down in Texas, you know, and a, and a, a T six would crash somewhere up in, I don't know, Craig Air Force Base or, or uh, somebody testing something would go down or, I mean, it was just all over the place, but I mean, it was a, uh, it was a dangerous time. I know this will rock you. Uh, 
my dad was at uh, Athen at Wright Pat before we went to Edmonds. And uh, he had, uh, he'd been a squadron commander in, in uh, Korea and in Germany. And uh, he had lots of recept time, you know, fighter time, you know, multi engine, all the stuff. And he didn't have any jet time. And they wouldn't let you transition to a jet if you didn't have any jet time. Catch twenty two, yeah, right. That's how so it, yeah, that's how it goes. He found, he found a, a a jet IP, a P thirty three IP that on cross countries in spare time would check him out in the P thirty three at at, at uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and he, he went through about three or four weeks of that, getting checked out in the engine and stuff, and the differences and things like that. So he had about 10 or 15 hours of jet time. And he got his three landings and stuff. So when he went to Edwards, you know, he had jet time. So they would check him out in the P-37 and the P-33s for cross countries. I mean, and then later on, you know, for flying time, he would fly the P-39. So that was definitely different. Yep. Different times. And I mean, I think a lot of people read Robin Olds in his biography and him talking about getting into an F-86. And again, it's like those things today, man, you probably would land yourself in some hot water if you tried tried some of that. But it's awesome to, to hear those stories. Again, just different times. Well, that's why I'm, I'm so proud of Brittany because uh, she was the first woman to get her first flight in an F-16 solo. They, all the all the D or uh, D models were grounded. That's so, yeah. I forgot about that. Uh, yeah, there, she didn't get any introduction other than simulator. She got in the airplane. And that was her first ride. Yeah. So, spoiler alert for those listening: uh, Jocko's daughter is also an F sixteen pilot, which is uh, it kind of shows that lineage. But I had forgotten about that. I had one friend who was going through the B course at that time when all the D models got grounded, and so. Yeah, training carried on and they got a, you know, normally it was five or six rides in a D model. So it was two seat with an instructor pilot, like I went through. And then your instrument check ride was ride five or six. And then you were cut loose to go solo, but they went straight out the chute solo the way it should be. But, you know, they got those pesky D models you got to ride around in every now and then. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. So she was the first female to, Solo and F sixteen. I think in the I guess they yeah. may she may have been the only one because they got the D model Yeah, they they did they did fix those, you know. Which it, the D models are fun to be able to give a ride to like maintainers and things like that. You never want like another F sixteen pilot in your backseat just watching, judging you. You know, you want to be mayor of Cockpit City there. So Well, um, that's sort of like FedEx, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 right. It's it's a slight it's a slightly different world when you got like four people in the cockpit. So what happened at Edwards in nineteen fifty six? Uh the Air Force Academy opened in fifty five. And there were three or four uh people from Edwards that became cadets. Okay. And they came home on the summer. And, uh, one of them was a young guy named Mike Ferguson, who, uh, later on, I believe, was on Thunderbird team. But. Now, were those enlisted or were they like I'm high school, like graduated high school and then like the first they, class of the academy? They were the first class. They were, they were, uh, sons of, uh, okay. And gotcha. he, was, he was a diver and I like to dive. In fact, I did that at, at the Air Force camp uh, many years later. But, uh, so he and, and a couple of other uh, the guys who were you know, my my mentor, I look up to, you know, things like that. So uh, that's when I start thinking about, hey, you know, my dad, my dad flew. I can go fly. I can go to a service academy. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Yeah. I saw my first F-4 in 1958. 
and I mean, talk about the impact. I was on my on yeah. bus, riding home to this distant location I lived at, and there were only a handful on the bus, but this one girl that never talked, but she was sort of, she knew everything. You know, she just let out a shrieking whistle like that and pointed, and we all turned and looked at the runway and we saw the silhouette of this F4 doing an FCIF. And it just came straight at the bus and went straight up, full after That's and I think awesome. Probably then I said, I want to fly an F4. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sold. Now, by the way. We're- that time frame, I've I've had a uh, few other gentlemen who were flying uh, in Vietnam about the time you were flying, and I always ask because much different than it is today. You know, where if someone goes to a restaurant, it's not uncommon that someone will anonymously buy their lunch or say at least you know thank you for your service, etc. The time period you're serving slightly different than today. Was that ever a thought that crossed your mind with going to join? Was it not a factor? What what was playing into your psyche then? You mean as before I went into the Air Force? Before you went into the Air Force and just given the you know, the nature of what the country was going through, both, you know, socially and political. Uh well the Korean War is over and it's still in the shadow of World War Two. Everybody had parents in served or uncles. In and so the military wasn't on anybody's back stool. There was no anti-military. Okay. Uh, they, they were just people that served abroad. You know, you know, had to play with neat toys if you want to look at that. Way. But the, the thing that, that I think I could say there, my perspective is, is skewed very much. It's skewed because I grew up on military bases. Everybody I knew was either a dependent or, as an adult, was somebody in the military. So I assumed the world was divided 50-50 between military and civil. So it was a real shock when I got out in the civilian world and stuff and found out that nobody had ever been in the military. Right. The anti-war stuff didn't start. Until the Vietnam era, <clears throat> and and I would even say maybe later than the Vietnam era, uh, my my basic uh, philosophy had already been formed. Gotcha. Well, and, going through because you did you go you went going to the Air Force Academy, correct? During that time period, did you start seeing any of that anti-war sentiment, oh, yeah. or was that still? I mean, I imagine you were right there in the thick of it. I enlisted. I enlisted in the Air Force in 1965. Okay. And went to the prep school at the Air Force Academy for a year. Got it. Got it. Uh, so from there through the time I, you know, probably you know, 1983. You know, there was always this sort of a unwritten tension. I can remember going back to the Pentagon and being told, uh, you know, wear civilian clothes. And at Luke Air Force Base, we were told not to wear your light suits home. Shame. Really? Yeah. That's... Uh, again, that's it's such a different time period, and uh, to me, what just I'm uh, biting off there the fact like Luke at that time. I mean, Luke is now it's built up. You know, Phoenix has expanded all the way to the edges of the town of Surprise there, and um, now I'm blanking on the other ones. But back in the day, Luke had to be out there in the middle of nowhere, far away from everything, almost. It was about 35 miles from uh, Glendale. I think it was Glendale or Glen. Greendale? I can't remember. Yeah, I buy, I buy Glendale. I buy that. And, and uh, you know, it was just road. Four lanes. Yeah. But it was just road. It took 45 minutes for me to get to work. So I was doing 90 miles a day going back and forth to work. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. So I went to a pilot train, by the way, at Willis. So I, I wasn't they, clo- all- they closed all the good ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't always a pilot. 
I went to the Air Force Academy, and uh, I uh, I went to NAV school and became a Lizzo in the Air and that's okay. what I was when I flew combat, you know, South and State. So, and that's, I know, so obviously go to the Air Force Academy, then become a WISO weapon system officer. Where did you do your training for? Where was WISO training that, at that time? Uh, the WISO training was at George Air Force Base. And of course, the NAV training was at, at uh, Maple. Up in, okay. Up in Northern California. So. How long was that checkout? At George? That was six Yeah, like from the time, I guess from the time you graduated, um, you know, Air Force Academy, and then you're showing up, become a, and go through navigation, WISO training to when you're now forward deployed. I mean, that was a relatively short from time that, span. From the day of graduation to the time I reported to Udo in Thailand was just shy of, let's see, 70. So I, I reported in, in in late March of 72. So I graduated okay. in 70. So it was two years and some change. That was June of 72. June of 70 when I graduated. So June of 72 would have been two years. So it was about, oh, uh, 20 months. Okay. I had two years. And then I guess for my you know, Pearson, graduated the B course and then show up to Shaw get assigned a squadron, integrate into the squadron, and then you deploy as a squadron. Is that the same process that was happening then, or is once you graduated, then you're forward deploying to backfill, or are you showing up to base X, Y, or Z, integrate into the squadron, and the squadron up and deploys together? How was that working then? The upgrade training, or not the initial training in the fighter, was called an RTU. Okay, which was a replacement training unit where they trained people to go to individual squadrons that were already in the war area, primarily. And then CCT was another name they called it, Combat Crew Training. Okay. So in my case, you'd go from, from your last ride at RTU, you'd have your orders, go on some leave, then you'd get on a Flying Tiger 747 and fly across the pond. <laughs> you'd spend, uh, you land at uh, Clark Air Force Base. You'd spend probably eight days there, a week of that in, in Jungle Survival School. And then they'd ship you to Tonsonu. You'd go to Tonsonu to check in the theater, essentially what it was. And then they'd say, okay, tomorrow morning you. You got a 130 that's going over to Thailand. So, you know, that's about it. You go over there and they fly at about three bases in Thailand. And of course, the last one is the one you get off at. Right. Some guy meets you and says, Are you Trimble? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> he grabs my bag and throws it in the back of a pickup truck and he says, Come on, let's go check in to the squadron before. We take you over to CEPO. So that's all the admin stuff. Then report into the squadron and they've already got you scheduled into a week or two of, of local area training and stuff that you're going through. Mm. So as far as, as checkout flights and stuff, I did not have to do that because I wasn't a pilot. Okay. They would just put me in the back seat maybe on an orientation ride with a, an instructor pilot, and we'd sit down and talk about different things, you know, getting all your bit checks done and, and some of the procedures and stuff like that, and some of the local ones that they had figured out. And then basically you sort of, you know, you weren't combat checked out yet. You had to go through a series of uh, flying missions. And each one is a combat mission. But the guy would write out a grade sheet on you. No kidding. And so on your 25th mission, then they would uh, give you a check right. And you'd say, okay, you're good. You don't need to have any more of this stuff. <clears throat> and that's 25 missions across the line. That's not like simulated training missions local. Yeah, they were. 
they were what we call uh because so I was just thinking, you know, for, you know, today someone shows up from the RTU or the B course to fighter squadron, they do an MQT mission qualification training program, which depending on the unit's mission set might be 10 rides, might be 12 rides that they're going through. And then like, for instance, my example, I did that MQT, which lasted about two months. Then we we're going to deploy and the whole squadron goes through a entire spin up process together. And then the whole squadron de forward deploys. So that's changed yeah, a little bit. It's the way it was then, but when you're in the combat zone, it was, you know, <clears throat> we haven't got a lot of spare sorties to just, you know, right. for a whizzo. And what they would do is they'd send you on basically a, a root pack, root pack one, which not root pack, uh, MR3, MR1, which is targets in the South Vietnam. Okay. You go down there and do close air support, or you possibly may uh, try and, you know, hit something down around the corner. I got there, and from the, <clears throat> from the time I left Travis Air Force Base, uh, flying to uh, Clark Air Force Base. That was on March 30th. <clears throat> Actually, it was on March 29th. Okay. As I went over the date line, I lost the 30th of March. <laughs> and when I landed, it was the 31st. <laughs> the North Vietnamese launched their offensive on the 30th of March. And when I landed, everybody scored. Oh my gosh, you know, the Huns are at the door. Yeah. You know, we got Sam's in Laos and Chapone. We've got, uh, they're coming across the DMZ. They're attacking Saigon. And I'm going, it wasn't like that when I left. Maybe it's because I'm just closer to the war now. But that wasn't the case. It was, everybody was starting to scramble. <clears throat> so the checkout was pretty quick in eight months. In the eight months that I was flying there, I had 186 combat missions. Wow. <laughs> that That's incredible. And I saw, I was going to ask, July 18th, 1972. So, I mean, you've only been there for a little bit. You were awarded a Distinguished Flying Cross. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that story? Does that <laughs> pop back up into your mind? Oh, yeah. Very much. That's a good story, by the way. In fact, I... I told that story to the, the 13th and 14th Pack Fighter Squadron at Masala. Which was the, uh, the mission was a mid cap. We were the second mid cap in. Uh, lead was, uh, Griff Bailey, Lieutenant Colonel, and, uh, Jeff Feinstein in his back seat. Griff Bailey, by the way, Three years earlier was my astro instructor at the Air Force Academy. Out. <laughs> Small world. You never want, you, yeah, you never know who you're going to wind up with in the strangest place. Right. But uh, I was flying with another guy, uh, Academy grad, and we were number two. And in number three and number four was the ops officer and uh, – a guy named Gip McGill, who was also an academy. The place was full of academy grads and instructors at the time. It just happened to be that way in that particular mission, it turned out. But <clears throat> so uh Steve Ritchie had the other mid cap and they were inbound. Or they were already in the uh, target area, which is up over Hanoi, and they they got tapped by uh some mid 19s and Red Crown asked us to expedite our ingress to uh, try and assist them because they were trying to get out of there. And so we're heading inbound in a fluid formation, fairly tactical, close in fast. And uh, Red Crown gave us a heads up. And Red Crown is the Navy radar unit sitting on a boat out in the Gulf Dark. <clears throat> gave us a heads up. We had a, uh, 
a blue bandit at 12 o'clock, seven miles. Closing. And uh, Jeff let him know that we had him on the radar using various equipment that we had. And, uh, and about that time, Griff Bailey goes, you know, Chevy Lee, tally ho. And this MIG was coming right at us. You can't see that on the screen. And he does, he does one of these things. He goes right up, turns around, and goes off. And, uh, Griff goes, we're engaged. We didn't use the word engaged at the time. That came later on, but it was right. clear that we're committed. <clears throat> and about that time, three goes, whoa, four, what are you doing? And I look back. I mean, number two, I looked back and three and four were doing this thing and they were gone. <laughs> and, and Bailey says, what do you got, three? He said, uh, four's got something. I think there's lots of radio, whatever. And Bailey said, exit the combat area. We're engaged. So we were a two ship now. We closed in and we're, the Air Force didn't like to use what they call loose deuce in the Navy at the time, but. We liked it as pilots and combat people. So this idea of being a two-man element, fully free to fight, was yeah. something pretty good. <clears throat> so, <laughs> Things out. So we started getting lower and lower. The MiG got lower and lower, and we closed on it. Okay. Uh, we were doing about 720 knots, and we were probably under 500 feet. And that's why we caught the MIG, because the MIG maxes out at about 690, and, and it goes unstable. It starts doing Dutch rolls, and that guy was trying to get away so fast, you know. My front seat that's was quick. Said, yeah. <laughs> he was the bait, obviously. You can see. <laughs> they had used yeah. him as the bait. And uh, when his wingman said, hey, uh, we can't do this with I'll tell him what happened later. Uh, I'm sure he knew he was dead. As we closed in, you know, my, my front seater goes, keep checking six, keep checking six. And I looked at the airspeed indi indicator and I said, there's nothing going to catch us right now. And I looked out and I could see the MIG doing the Dutch rolls and he was only about probably two miles ahead of us. Okay. And Feinstein, in the meantime, and Griff had had launched four AIM sevens, and one of them just fell off and didn't ignite. One of them just went off to the right somewhere. Uh, the other one lit and went, and it was going great. And no kid hit a tree. This is it was starting <laughs> to come up. Hit a tree. And the other one went off and, and, and looked like it hit a, uh, a, a rice paddy or something. Uh, we got accused later on of attacking the dikes, but then <clears throat> I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, gotta get a MIG. They're gonna get us. <laughs> gonna get a MIG, you know? And Griff Bailey launched that first AIM-9L that he had on the airplane. And that thing just went, <laughs> boom. Oh, <geez. laughs> and, no kidding. It, it blew the right wing off the MiG completely. And it, as the MiG started to roll down into that wing, all of a sudden, the roll on it reversed, the nose came up, and I could see that pilot in. I couldn't see the pilot. I could imagine the guy had yeah. just stomped left rudder as hard as he possibly could to try and get that back around. He couldn't see what was missing, you know. And that plane came up like that and rolled and went boom right into the ground. And just, just a big, you know, there wasn't a big fireball because this guy was out of fuel. You know, it just big, big splosh went. And uh, that was <clears throat> that was a day that I got my first DFC. <clears throat> That's incredible. The, you know, to have that guy and then and run him down. I could say so. In the Viper, I got to 780 knots, and that's that was uncomfortable, and that was at medium altitude. I can't imagine running someone down doing 720 knots. I, I, I've been faster. 
Yeah. I, think so. <laughs> I won't go that way. That's another story. Uh, here's, so we go back to the debrief. We had a 2.1 root pack six mission with a mid kill. The shortest one, I think, in the, the history of the war. <clears throat> and uh, we go back and, and of course, uh, three and four come in and sit down. Around the word, Griff goes, what happened, three? Uh, he said, well, I'll let four tell the story. So they were, there they were on the commit, you know, they're doing everything right. And the Wizzo in number four looks back up high at about eight o'clock. And what he's got is two MiG-21s are a, a diving turn coming in to come in behind us while we're going after the MiG. And he calls them out and the front seater sees them and keys the radio mic and nothing happens. There's no sound. The radios are dead. No kidding. So he goes into full afterburner, and they did it. You know, it's a slice back across like that, and uh, the other two MiGs abandoned the attack. And I'll bet that was a good radio call that they passed on. Uh, but uh, what had happened is while they were going into the initial engagement, the checklist had fallen from the leg of the Wizzo, and it hit the radio thing, which is right down by your left leg. And if you hit those little buttons, they would pop up and turn the radio on. A sharp, sharp guy, but you know what? He owned up to it. He said, you know, and we all did that. If we did, screwed up, we owned up to it because it meant maybe you'll save somebody's life next time. To the North Vietnamese, if they saw an F4 and afterburner turning the nose at you, they knew they were already painted, which may or may not have been true, but they figured that, you know. <clears throat> now, I think, interestingly enough, the way we know tactics now, and, and I think Americans in that situation, as soon as those, uh, if those had been MiG-21s doing a slice back and coming right at us, we light the burner and blow straight through them and go for leading the other guy. That's, that's the way I think about it. But <clears throat> but anyway, so, you know, that was uh, that was what that one was all about. The, uh, if you were in a flight that shot down a MiG, you got a DFC. Even if it was an accident. That's just the way they did it. I mean, I say that. I mean, that's ingracious because... You know, everybody, it takes everybody in the flight, especially in this case, in a lot of ways, <clears throat> you know, to get it done. I mean, if if you went on the heroics of this thing, the guy that ought to get the silver star is number four, who put it in the afterburner and broke into three. You know, he was the first lieutenant at the time. I, I assume... You know, never having been in that situation, but you, I, how do you attack that? I imagine you got a job to do, but you're seeing the air picture, the surface air missile threat that's probably growing and intensifying day to day. And then, like you said, you're, you're losing buddies. It's pretty, pretty busy time, but do you just put your head down and, and charge forward or how'd you attack that? <clears throat> Uh, well, the days weren't normal then. It was especially uh, in May of 72, I got almost 72 hours of flying. And right. the reason was because I'd only been there a month <clears throat> and I was, you know, checked out air to ground and whatever. Uh, we would fly triple bangs down to Saigon, <clears throat> take off from Udorn, loaded wall to wall, hit a tanker, fly into the Anlock Road area, which was north of Saigon, coming out of uh, Cambodia, talk to a FAC, he'd give us uh, guidance on a target, we'd hit the target, land at Tan Sanut in Saigon, 
we would just load up internal fuel only and bombs. We'd go out, hit another target, and they would fly back to Tonsanu, uh, take a full load of fuel, load up the bombs, and then we would fly north up toward Da Nang and hit targets working with a FAC or working with an uh, AB Triple C, an airborne uh, command post on Sky Spot or something like that with the other bombs that we had. And then we would fly back to, uh, to Udorn, maybe hitting a tanker if we needed to. So, so it was, <clears throat> it was a long, long day. You know, you'd get probably six, seven hours of flying time just in that, that one day. Uh, and I did that all through May. Uh, we hadn't, <clears throat> we hadn't really started going back north yet. I got there on the first week of April and it was April 10th was the first time that the U.S. went back over North Vietnam, uh, Hanoi area since 1968. So that was the beginning of linebacker one. <clears throat> and it just, it ramped up from there. Uh, it, there wasn't a really a typical day. It was a, a brief fly, debrief, eat, go to sleep, get up about 11 o'clock at night, go check the schedule to see if you're on it, go back to sleep, get up at 3.30, go brief, get ready to go. <clears throat> I, I was, you know, a thousand meter stare. I mean, everybody was like, you know, <clears throat> but it was important. And we were losing guys. You know, we were losing people. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, on, on April 10th, when they first went back, Udorn shot down three MiGs. And everybody was cheering and way that was happy. Two days later, we went back and <clears throat> the 13th lost the, an airplane, and, and so did uh, so did the triple nickel. I think probably on the triple nickel, uh, uh, the squadron commander Kittinger was shot down with a classmate of mine in his back seat. And in the thirteenth, we lost uh, uh, Dennis Wilson and uh, Jeff Harris, and it was just they're out in a four ship. Uh, you know, doing their standard fluid four and <clears throat> thinking that they've got this all figured out. And the next thing somebody knows is they look back and there's a, two MiG-19s camped on the back of uh, four, just pouring 30 millimeters into it, 37 millimeters. So that's, it, it was, it was, it was kind of a, when I talk about it now, I just, you know, I think, wow, it, it was it was a tough time there. And, of course, meanwhile, the world was just catching up to the fact that the war is going on again. I went on a four-ship uh, bombing run where the flight lead was a major, <clears throat> and there was a major in his backseat who was the lead whizzo, and the only other major in the flight, actually, there was one captain and another major whizzo, and the rest were first lieutenants. <clears throat> and it was young, you know. And in late August, we started getting all the help coming over from TAC, people that had flown before and stuff, and were coming in and, you know, trying to get their last leg in before the war was over, I guess is what they were thinking. <clears throat> so it, it was, uh, you know, basically you kept your heart in your pocket and your your eyes open and, and just survive. You get through one day and you go to the next and say, okay. <clears throat> you know, within a fighter squadron, you know, the last thing you want to be known as is somebody that, you know, is nervous. So you kind of try and put on your poker face and everybody does. And everybody may, makes a joke about it and kind of laughs, but not too much, but <clears throat> I mean, I've sat in the arming area watching the backseater and stuff, you know, getting getting sick before he goes fly. And it's not because 
he's you know had something bad to eat, it's because you know he knows we're going up into Route Pack Six, up into the Hanoi area, and he's just he's got a wife and kids at home, and he, he's thinking about it. I I wasn't married, and I didn't have any any thing like that going on. But <clears throat> uh, the other thing is, you go up, you hit a tanker on a four ship, and uh, on important missions, they'd send up five airplanes to make sure you had a full four ship going. And if you were the spare, you're sitting up there hoping somebody breaks so you can go on the mission, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and the other thing is nobody that's up there is going to break because they don't want to give it to the spare. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind of yeah. I, went in, I went into a Root Pack 6 mission on one generator, two generator airplanes. I didn't. My pilot didn't. Yeah. He didn't really I, ask it's one of the, I, I know you're talking, it's like, I, I always said there was once I was uh, in the jet and it was running, you know, I mean, it, it would take a lot to get me not to go, you know, basically like I can't, I can't do anything with this piece cause it can't drop weapons. You're like, all right, well now I'm useless, but past that we'll write this up after the sortie, you know, I, you know what that went on in world war two and you can go back and read books <laughs> and they did that in world war one. You know. Yeah. I'm flying, man. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Maintenance will get this back in a few hours and they can solve it then. But until then, this is my jet and I'm going to work through it. The, uh, the tempo going into the fall and into the early winter, I imagine it still was pretty busy. Cause I would like, if you're willing to, I'd like to talk about December 27th. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, at the end of, uh, about the 15th of October, there was a cessation of any bombing in North Vietnam. We stopped going north. <clears throat> and uh, in the diplomatic side of it, they were talking about, you know, a peace initiative or something. Looking back at it now, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe it was sort of like a uh, October surprise type of thing for the politicians in the United States because the North Vietnamese were not anywhere going to do a peace initiative. And right. So we were sitting there and just basically flying missions in the south and relatively low threat, you know. Uh, and sometimes we'd do what they call barrier caps. You'd fly up into uh, Laos and just as a two ship and just act as like a barrier cap because there'd be a C-130 up there that has got a, we call them Buffalo Hunters, is the name of the mission, but it had a drone on its wing that it would let loose and it would fly through North Vietnam and take pictures. And uh, then they would recover it out in the Gulf of Tonkin. But uh, you just basically fly around in circles and when the, when the 130's mission was over, they'd say, okay, you can go home. And so you'd, you know, as the flight goes, you had a lot of extra fuel, and guys would just do air training and things like that over over Laos, or they would do it, you know, in uh, in northern Thailand while we're doing it. And it was a uh, one time in November. Uh, we got a call. We were airborne for some reason. It wasn't a barrier cap. We were coming back in mid-morning, and we got a call that said, hey, uh, they've got the, uh, you know, the, the rescue helicopters up and stuff. And uh, they asked if, if, if we could go over and, and cap for it. And we couldn't because we were down on fuel. And they, had not, they had plenty of flights around. So turns out two guys coming back from... Uh, from a barrier cap had decided to, in the triple nickel, had decided to do some BFM training. And they got into the the fight and doing the training and, and broke through the bottom of the altitude they had reached. And lead had about a 60 degrees nose down, you know, going through about 8,000 feet. And, you know, his wingman said, pull out, you know. And the airplane did a massive pullout and then departed about a thousand feet above the ground, and they both went in. Oh man! I, I lost a classmate in that. 
a guy named Bud Hargrove. Uh, Tibbetts was a guy in the front. Both together, those guys had two MIGs. You know, okay. you know, as a crew. Yeah. What a loss. You know, it's a crazy thing. Uh, coming back on another uh, mission a little bit earlier in the, in the fall. We had a lot of extra fuel and uh, barrier. The, the bar cap was gone. Uh, and we asked uh, Brigham, who is our air traffic control guy, you know, told him we were, you know, we wanted some airspace up above. I, my front seater was doing this. He and the wingman had worked out what they were going to do. And he just said, hey, we're going to go fast for a little bit. You weren't allowed to go supersonic in Thailand. And I said, okay. And so he he unloads, two unloads, lights the burners, and they accelerate, and they slip through the mock in about 1.3, and we still had tanks on. I'm going, golly. But the problem that really worried me is we're heading right toward the Thai border. Yeah, I said, hey, you know, we can't go into Thailand supersonic. He says, we won't. And he started his nose up. And I looked over, and there goes two. He's coming up with us. Yeah, he's about 6,000 feet out. And uh, I saw some pretty dark sky that morning. And I saw, I saw 53,000 feet on the, the altimeter. And I told the front seater, I said, you know, if we lose pressurization, poof. That's it. And uh, he said, don't touch anything. The engines haven't flamed out yet. And they never did. He, he gently took them out of afterburner once he knew we were in ballistic. But uh, we just went, dropped back straight down. We must have dropped two or 3,000 feet just coming straight down with the tail. And then it swung back and did this nice swing. It seemed like forever. And I looked over, two was doing the same thing. We came back. Oh my gosh! I thought you sit down, you yeah, you know, brief, debrief. I, I was the first lieutenant, you know. I was going, wow. I said that was high. He goes, yeah. yeah, that was cool, wasn't it? I go, mm, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your definition it's, of cool. It was cool now, you know. Yeah. But, uh, so that's when I learned. I sort of learned that adage that that I've used in the back of my mind all my life is just it's uh how would you explain that to the accident board you know and that's it sits there that's it i i start i think the more experience you get and especially when you get put in these scenarios um i always envisioning how the accident report's going to start to read yeah. you know and it's like at any one of these points someone could have stopped this chain reaction that would have prevented this mishap from happening um and i think it's just yeah as you get a few more laps under your belt you start realizing like mm, is it? And, and as you point to these stories the air force there's a lot of things you can't do and i think it's lessons learned in blood yeah. a lot of the stuff you know combat Sorties today, if you drop everything and the jet's clean, like you're probably not going to go do BFM because you haven't done BFM in four months. You know, you're going to wait till you get home and everyone's going to kind of go through a requalification training, you know, to kind of do it right. So you don't put a jet out of control or do something. You know, ideally, you don't put a jet out of control. Well, they codified everything uh, in, in the BFM training. Later on, as I went back through in the front seat and went through the various training scenarios and and the things that they realized that the BFM training was killing a lot of guys. There were people in Spain that were killed, you know, because the guy didn't call, you know, he, he called disengage, you know, and that's when the whole Air Force said, hey, from now on, the terminology is knock it off, knock it off, knock it off, because disengage sounds like I'm engaged. And, yep. you know, the guy lost him in the sun, and the next thing he, had a mouthful of airplane. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so coming th into uh, into December, we were all kind of sitting there going, I wonder what's going on. Uh, and then on the 16th, there was a briefing. Selected group of people uh, went in, 
had their briefings and stuff and then, you know, came out. And they weren't allowed to talk about what was going to happen. And uh, I said, okay. But uh, I decided I'd go over to the chapel that night. It was packed. The chapel was packed. And uh, I knew what was going on. And uh, talked to a, a good friend of Wizzo of mine that was on the first strike in with the B-52s and stuff. And uh, I was on the next strike in the next night going in. So through those, oh, what, it was about nine days before I was shot down, I was flying uh, the night strikes going in until I had to abort on one. And uh, that put me into a cycle to go into the day strike just on crew rest. And yeah. they were, you know, they were loading everything they had on every airplane they had. You know, some guys were going up into North Vietnam with one heat missile and one functioning radar missile. You know, because everything else was already loaded on the airplanes, all the other airplanes and stuff. And uh, that's war. You know, I'm sure the Russians are finding that out. Yeah. You know, but the uh, the day I was shot down was the uh, 27th of December, and we took off out of Udor, and the the mission was to uh, escort a four ship escort of F fours for 24 A sevens that were going up to hit a target to the it was actually to the northwest of Hanoi, about 11 to 15 miles out of Hanoi. It was an intelligence complex center that they wanted to hit. Well, I thought it was strange because the A7s carry A9s on them, and even if they have bombs, they can defend themselves pretty well. But yeah. so we were up there, and it was uh, we we took off from Udon and waited for the uh, A7s to check in, and we waited for two hours. And then the A7s came up on the radio, said they weren't going to go to the tanker, just to meet them at the, you know, there's a geographic point that we had, the, the fish's mouth is what it was called, and just meet them there, and the tankers were going to drop us off there, and meet them there, and we'd go into the target. And so that worked out, joined up, and here you've got these, you know, you've got six, four ships of A7s. As a matter of fact, I think what they had is four six ships is what they were flying in. And uh, they were just heading in. And, you know, we <laughs> we checked in on frequency and we could hear the, the beacon going off. Somebody, some American somewhere had, you know, been shot down and headed on in uh, about, you know, five minutes toward Hanoi. The uh, the Red Crown called Lead and asked if uh, he could split up his flight because he's got MIG activity north of Hanoi and he wanted to use Lead and two and leave us to escort. So we did that and we split off, s split up as a loose deuce group now rather than the four ship. And uh, Lead and two went off to do whatever they could help Red Crown with. And we watched the A7s go in and hit the target. And it was, I know the flight lead was the first one to roll in. And I could see that the target, it was almost like a, a fortress complex. <clears throat> and he rolled in and his bombs were about a mile and a half long. <laughs> and I remember saying, man, I thought those A7s could bomb. But Two through twenty-four, put them right down the smokestack. They dug a hole. <laughs> you know, I'd say they dug a hole in China, but China was right there. They, you know, right. They were, they were trying to go home with it. I guess it was amazing <laughs> to watch. And we we covered them as they came off and swept back around, basically heading. We were the plan was to head toward the east and then turn back around and then head uh, two seven zero out of the theater and back to Udor. 
uh, Udorn was a heading of 210. But 270 would get us back with the A7, so we'd all leave happily ever after. And we had just turned to the east, and I looked down, and it, it was cl cloudy, not overcast, but splotchy cloudy. I looked down and saw a MiG-21 below us, very fast, going out in front of us. And I called it out to, to uh, my front seater, and he saw it and made a call, you know, to, to, to four at the time. He said, hey, stick with us. We're engaged. We got abandoned or whatever. And he, he rolled over on him. And by then I had a radar lock on him. And for some reason, the lock kept breaking. You know? And a front seater saying, switch the red crown frequency. We've got to get clearance to fire. Because with all the airplanes up there, the ROE was, you know, combat tree and a visual and clearance from red crown. Two of those three you had to have. Okay. <clears throat> you know, we only had one right now. And so I went to that frequency, and he called them and asked them if they had any bandits airborne, and they said no. And I'm sitting there saying, I got a full system lock, and it would break, and it would break. And, it, and yeah. what I thought he was doing was auto acting it on the throttle to try and put it in the pipper. Okay. And I was later on in prison, I was really angry at him because I said, you know, <laughs> I had him locked up, you know. But it dawns on me now that, you know, they have pods too. And I think probably the the uh, the MIG was trying to, you know, whatever defensive electronics it had was trying to steal the range gate on it. And, you know, I'll just give him that benefit. <clears throat> but then he goes, I lost sight. You know, and that was one that just goes, uh oh. So he started a hard climbing left turn to the south so we could then come back around and get out. And, uh, and during this time, we realized we still had our center line tank on. Two had already gotten rid of his. So if we were going to tangle up anymore, we need to get rid of the center line tank. And so we did that. And I thought the tank came off hard. I, you know, it came off harder than any tank I've ever felt come off. But we we unloaded and started to accelerate out. And uh, <clears throat> about the time, it was probably about a minute and a half, there was a controlling agency disco on an EC-121 that was monitoring communications. And they put out on guard, basically, heads up, bandits attacking, bullseye, said 220 at 23. And I looked down and we were at about 225 or 2230 at about 30. And I just went, oh man. I said, come hard right. And just as we started a hard right in burner, uh, we got hit. Boom. Yeah. Going through 16.5 at 490 true. <clears throat> and uh, instant negative Gs. And the plane was doing, I don't think it was fully, fully rolling over or what, but I, uh, <clears throat> I tried to get my hand on the handle down in between them my legs and I was plastered on the top of the canopy already and I got down and, and it pulled and I, went, I was gone. I don't think it was an accident. I think I decided that I'm going to go. I talked with my front seater later and he said, well, you were a little early, but <clears throat> I, I figured out that when I went out in the airplane, I was actually blasted down because the plane was inverted. And then when the drogue shoot right in my seat, the plane caught up with me. And it missed me by about 100 feet over on my, my right side. And I could see the back end of it burning and everything like that. And I watched that. And I just sat in the seat. And I heard the 
the aerostatic timer going off and then the chute opened up and pulled me out and uh, I checked the chute made sure it was good and I looked down again and I saw my airplane impact you know, and blow up <clears throat> everything was really quiet you know except for the wind and uh, I looked around at my level and I didn't see any parachutes and that really that made an impact on me and uh, I looked down and, I, and I, then I did see a parachute down probably probably about 4,000 feet from me and it was going down fast and had had a panel torn out of it and that was my front seater and uh, he was he wasn't fat but he's a big man he's six foot two and when he went out at 490 true the uh he took quite a shot. As a matter of fact, with him, he had one of those uh, uh, commercial-made helmets that they were making back okay. then uh, for guys to get because they were better than the, the flimsy military ones. And he had the pull-down visor, and his visor had split down the middle, okay? It peeled off this way and, and cut circles underneath his eye. Oh. They, yeah. they weren't really, they weren't deep enough for stitches and stuff. But, you know, when he recovered from getting yanked pretty hard and he looked down, he's got blood here. He can't see because he, he's got blood in his eyes. You know, and uh, oh. it was it was a tough time. Uh, but we were out and we're both alive, but I wouldn't see him for another eight hours or so after we both captured the guy. How close did you guys land? Oh, we were a couple miles apart. Yeah. Okay. And it was, it was, uh, he was captured as soon as he hit the ground. Okay. Uh, I managed to, uh, make a four line cut and I was looking around. I could hear something and I couldn't tell what it was. And, and I did make a radio call to an F4 I saw flying around. I assumed it was number four. Okay, later on it turned out it wasn't. It was somebody else. But uh, I checked for, you know, my equipment, my pistol that I'd had strapped on my side. It, it left me when the chute opened. And uh, the water bottles that I'd had in my G-suit pockets, those were gone. And uh, I looked down, I was still probably about 5,000 feet above the ground. And I looked down, and I, I was coming right down in the village. And they, I could see the puff of smoke that they were shooting at me. So I didn't think they were going to be able to hit me. But I thought it wasn't time to come down in the village. So I, I went ahead and, and did a slip with my chute. And, and managed to get it over near the ridge lines and clear the ridge. And then I could see the ground coming up and I just put my knees together as tight as I could. And I put my arms up and I put my visor down and I just looked out at the horizon. I was waiting for that tree impact, you know, that I was gonna clobber or I was gonna hit some rocky piece of karst that was sticking up. And the branches started swishing around and I came to a nice gentle stop. You know, hanging in the chute, and I put out my right foot and touched the ground. There was just like a wave of relief. You know, uh, I can get real religious about this for a moment, but it was like sometimes things happen, but I really felt someone was taking care of me. <clears throat> and I <clears throat> checked my equipment real quick. Because I had seen the villagers running towards that ridge line, and I heard them coming over the top, and I didn't have time to grab everything. I just took off, and I managed to get about a hundred yards away from the chute and hiding in some brush. And I was fairly quiet there, and that I could hear them over by my chute, and they were shooting up into the trees and stuff. And I think they were trying to get me to panic and run, which they would be able to get me. I just lay real still. 
and they got quiet. They moved out of the area. And I found out later why, because uh, there was a SAR effort going on deep in North Vietnam, right underneath us, when I was shot down. There was a MD-11 crew that they were trying to recover. <clears throat> and there was a whole flight of, of Sandy A-7s up there with Jolly Greens. And if, you've, if you're a North Vietnamese, the last thing you want to do is be hanging around an American parachute when you got A-7s going around. So they split real fast. Uh, incidentally, as I found out, three of my classmates were on that flight of A-7s from the academy. No kidding. And <clears throat> so it got real quiet, and I'm sitting there thinking, hmm, if I can just make it to nightfall, because this is late afternoon now, you know, maybe I can move and I was going to walk home to Udorn. I mean, that was the initial plan. <laughs> uh, you know. <clears throat> wow. Optimistic. I didn't have any plans before that. So right. Right, yeah. This is sort of planning and on the go. <clears throat> and then I heard a quick snap, fly. you know, a little farther away. And I didn't move, but I could look up. And I saw two guys walking through the, I could say jungle, but it's not jungle there. It, it's like a, a tropical forest type of thing. I could see them walking through, and they're doing the, the high step, walking very quietly. They didn't have any insignia on. They weren't, they weren't dressed in, in militia uniform. And my impression was that these are snake eaters. But I wasn't about to expose myself to them. I don't know. They looked, they looked like that to me, the way they were going. And, really? And uh, I just let them walk by. One of them walked within about eight feet of me. And I swear we had that moment of eye contact but he just kept right on going and I honestly do not know who I saw out there I have gone into the community the uh, the Delta Force community the Navy guys things like that to find out well, did you guys have anybody in there and I thought maybe they had somebody in there you know with the SAR effort that was going on but they go no so I just lay still, got quiet again. I did make a brief radio call to say that uh, basically that I'll come up at midnight on radio and then put that away. And then I heard some more twigs and stuff. And I looked up again and here come two Vietnamese walking right toward me. It was a farmer and his ancient mother are walking across this brush area and stuff to see what all the commotion was. And they walked right on me and stumbled on me. And he ran off and left her there to watch me real quick while he goes and yells for help and stuff. And I stood up and looked and she was absolutely terrified. But I knew there was no way I was going to get away from her, you know, without hurting her. Right. And that was a John Wayne woman moment for me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what would John Wayne do? He's not going to hurt a grandmother. I, I resolved that, okay, I'm captured. And I, I took my uh, CAC bush, my the uh, paper CAC thing we used for code and stuff. And I ripped the paper out and I started digging a hole and I buried that in there. And uh, in the meantime, there were people gathering all around. And somebody said, uh, I swear he said it in English. He said, get up. You know, and uh, I looked up from where I was. I was, I was on a slope looking up at them. And uh, I saw about nine guys with, with all with muzzles pointed right at me. It, all of them had different sizes. Some of them were really big looking. You know? And uh, 
I started to get up and I slipped, literally slipped. And I fell down on the ground and put my hands out. And there was a bush there that I'd been hiding under. And they opened up. And that bush just disappeared. And I, I, I jumped up, my hands up. And I said, don't shoot, don't shoot. You know, and they stopped, you know. I think they were, they looked a little stunned when I said, don't shoot. And uh, later on, in, in an interrogation I went through with the North Vietnamese, they asked me where I learned Vietnamese. And I don't know anything in Vietnamese because the report was that I stood up saying, don't shoot in Vietnamese. Really? And, and that fits in with their guy. That I heard someone say, get up. But they didn't know any English. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. It's weird. There were strange things going on. But I think, I think our minds are far more complex and uh, different than, than we can imagine. There was a communication that needed to be done at both times. That, you know, telepathy, I guess. I'm, I'm thinking, but but anyway, they so they captured me and hogtied me, and it was a, a fairly long saga. I didn't need to go through that trying to get to uh, to wherever they were going to take me. I, I wrote a, about a portion of it when I finally got to the village where they were going to meet up with uh, the regular forces that. Uh, they pulled me out in front and the village came out and everybody's around and there was this this uh, Vietnamese lieutenant in, in regular military uniform and he was yelling at the crowd and pointing to me and they were getting all kind of excited and right now I'm, I'm basically in my skivvies because they took my flight suit and uh, <clears throat> so I'm sitting there with my hands tied behind my back and just sort of watching this. And he comes over and he draws back and he, he hits me in the mouth. And I could see that I could see him throwing this punch and I rolled my head off. It didn't really hurt much, you know, but I could, you know, bloody my lip or whatever. And the crowd just went electric. And I just had this thought in my mind that, well, they're probably gonna take me now, you know. I'm on runaway roller coaster and I have no control of anything that's going on and uh, he yelled at them and yelled at me and he, he comes to hit me again and, and it, you know he didn't hit me very hard and I think that pissed him off so he started to hit me again and an old man comes out of the crowd and grabs his arm and just starts chewing him out in front of everybody you know and I just thought you know we're just humans, aren't we? And uh, of course, he looked at me like, you know, if I get a chance, I'm going to slit your throat. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, don't, you know, I'd do the same too. <laughs> but, yeah. So they took me up into this village. The sun had gone down now, and I was, I was actually shivering. I was getting, I am starting to go into shock, I think, probably. Uh, this is December, and it, it gets pretty cold. To get down to the 40s and I was cold and so they gave me my flight suit back and uh, <clears throat> before they did that you know somebody pointed a pointy talkie and said would you like I said I'm really thirsty so they said oh okay so they brought me this cup and in an effort to stop disease and stuff the North Vietnamese had set up a, a a national system of hygiene and everything where you boil the water to make sure you kill everything. And they handed me this cup and it just really felt warm, you know, but I couldn't hold it, my hands were tied. So they held it to my lips. It was boiling water. And oh, it just, it just burned everything in my mouth and everywhere, you know. And then there was more discussion about, you idiot, you can't give them boiling water. And they gave me my flight suit back. They locked me in a place with a guard. Uh, 
before the guard came in, I'm sitting in there. My eyes are really starting to hurt. And it's because I had contacts in. I was wearing contacts. It's a orthokeratology. It corrects vision. And uh, they were really starting to, you know, it had been a long day. It had been through a lot. And I thought, what am I going to do with these contacts? And I thought, well, I'll just put them in my mouth. And I took them out and rubbed my eyes, put them right, you know, right and left. And I sat there for about 10 seconds. And I thought about that. And I went, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I could be here for 10 years. I mean, I'm not going to be putting my contacts in. So I sat there. It had a little little lantern type light thing. It got dark. That was the only light. And at the time, they, there was one guard, a young soldier, very quiet, didn't say a word, just sat there. And I had a bench. And I laid down on that bench and went to sleep. And the next thing I know, I, I heard some movement. And I opened my eyes and remembered where I was. And I looked in the the entire upper hierarchy of that village had very quietly, from the mayor and his wife all the way down through, had moved in to this room and was sitting there or standing there just looking at me. And you know, when they saw me waking up, they they just they didn't say anything, you know, because they they knew that I was going to be taken off. And I did something that I learned in Thailand that, you know, I just, you know, I thanked them. Basically, I was trying to thank them for giving me the water, and, you know, not doing other things to me. But uh, so then they came and, and took me and put me in a vehicle and uh, with a mixed group of soldiers. One was a, a female soldier and put me in there and <clears throat> drove us. We drove all over the place and I had a really tight uh, bandage on my head that they, you know, keep me from seeing where we're going or whatever. <laughs> and we drove for about an hour <clears throat> and it seemed like we stopped about every 20 minutes to, I guess it was a checkpoint or whatever. And then they stopped at this one <clears throat> and they pulled me out of this truck and I'm standing there and I'm saying, what's going on? You know, and then I heard the AK-47, you know, ratchet round and uh, I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. And all of a sudden there was this bright flash and that'll skip your heart. And they were taking a picture of me and with this girl holding the AK-47. Uh, and then they put me back in the truck. They tied me up at the top of the truck, hoisted me up, and uh, then they went off. Evidently, they, they had stopped by and picked up my survival kit on the way and uh, managed to divvy up the goods that were in it. So. The reason they were stopping there and waiting is because Hanoi was being attacked again. I could hear the sirens in the distance going off. And they came out after a while, and there were some other things that went on. I don't need to go into. Anyway, they, they took me out of the truck, <clears throat> and they walked me down this gravel road, and I was barefoot. It really hurt. And... Uh, and there was another truck down at the bottom of this waiting. And they threw me back in there. And just as I was getting up into this truck, I looked underneath my uh, blindfold and I saw my front seater sitting there. He was blindfolded too. Wow, was that a good feeling? Man, he made it, you know. And uh, I wouldn't see him again for another four hours. But I tried to talk to him and somebody hit me with something. I said, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. So we drove on into Hanoi and it was mid-morning when we uh, were pulled out of this truck and taken into a basically a cursory uh, interrogation and uh, blindfolded. And then I was put in a room by myself. Found out later on that we were in the Hilton, Hanoi Hilton. Jeez. 
So that's pretty much what happened on December 27th. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is, uh, that's a lot. Thank you for your service. Um, it's something that, you know, nowadays that has been fortunate that it's not something that happens on a routine basis. I think probably Desert Storm was the last time we really uh, had POWs, but it's always the forefront. And I know that was more common then. I don't want to, uh, I know I don't want to skip across it. If you if you want to say anything, absolutely, I can appreciate the uh, sensitivity of it. But you spent about six months in it uh, in the Hanoi Hilton, or in ninety a, days. How many? Ninety days. Ninety days. Uh, more days than I was. Uh, it turns out that I was the last Air Force F four shot down. Okay. And, there was a couple of Navy guys shot down the next morning, and that was it. Wow. So it was, uh, if you're going to do it, be the last one shot down. <laughs> and and uh, I figured probably I'd be there about four years is what I thought. So I, I had no idea that anything else was going to change. At that point in time, all it was is uh, code of conduct is what, you know, Survive, keep faith with your fellow man, and don't disgrace yourself. It's one of those things going through survival training and reading books and hearing gentlemen like you talk about that. For me to process it, going through survival training is nothing in comparison, obviously. But even so, you know, there's it's a finite period. You know, it's three days of resistance training, and again, they can't really they can't do anything to permanently damage you. Uh, you know, they're they're handcuffed when they're doing that training. But you know, even though it's not fun, comparatively, it's uh, cakewalk. But also, you know, it's going to end in seventy two hours or forty eight hours, whatever it might be. That unknown for me, not knowing if it'd be six years, four months, four years would be really challenging. I imagine that's that's got to be a challenge. I don't know. Is that, uh, is that fair? That's a fair assessment, except I, can I regress a little bit? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, when, when I went through survival training, I was, uh, I was a cadet. And we didn't have to go through, you know, Fairchild or Stead. And one of the night survival E and E exercises we had, where they would take about three hundred of us out in the woods, uh, fields and woods there in Colorado, and you know it was like the Oklahoma land rush. You know they'd say, "Go bang," you know, and everybody would run off into the dark woods. And the object was we all had maps and flashlights, and we were supposed to get to checkpoint A without getting caught. Well, yeah, we, we knew that was rigged. Right. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Well, <laughs> yeah. So my classmate Sam Popple and I came up with a plan and said, you know what? We're going to run about 100 yards and we're going to lie down flat on the ground because it's dark and they won't see us. He said, yeah, that's a good idea, Jack. So we did that, and the rest of the herd, you know, bubbled off into it, and they were going to give them about 20 minutes or so to go off and, you know, get hurt in the woods. And where we were lying, I could look up, I could see all the upperclassmen sitting there by the bus and everything, yucking it up, talking about, you know, dumb squat this and that. And finally they, you know, they fired another round, and they were started walking, you know. And they were walking right towards us. And I was thinking, Tremble, you, this is the dumbest <laughs> you've ever, they probably saw us lie down, you know? So I stuck to the game. I just lay there real still. And I knew Papa was about 10 yards to my left. And we just lay there. Didn't move, didn't do anything. And three of them walked right in between us and never saw us. But most of all, I'm surprised they couldn't hear my heart beating because it was shaking the ground where I was. When I was 
lying on the ground in North Vietnam. And I saw those two guys looking for me. I thought about that training I'd had. And my pulse was absolutely calm. It was like I've been here before. You know? In the first one, I knew they weren't going to kill me. In the second one, I thought it was 50-50, yeah. you know. If you know, I didn't know, but things had already really gone bad for me that day already, so I wasn't, you know, going to roll the dice on it. But also some things had really gone good for me that day. You know. And so but back to the training point, I would like to say when that point in time comes and you need it, the important things will will stand out. And you'll remember the guy saying the very words that you're thinking about, that you're using at the time. It, it's just one of those things. I, and I briefed that, and I told that story at the Air Force Academy when I was an AOC there. So uh, it, it, the training was good. I, it's an interesting thing. I, when I was uh, at the Academy uh, prison of war training, I escaped from their camp. You know, I, I wasn't going to try and do that up where I was. Yeah. The training, as, as funny as it may seem, somebody has written it because it was based on experience that, that those of us who were in Southeast Asia had. What was it like? What was the feeling when you came home? Uh that's an essay question. Uh, very happy, obviously. You know, all of us getting out of there was was the big thing. But but I don't think any of us were quite ready for the groundswell of uh, reception that we were going to receive. You know, I think a lot of us just wanted to come home and say, "Hey, phew, made that one next." You know, but uh, it was in a lot of cases overwhelming. Uh, I can only speak for myself. Um, I've talked with some of the other guys that were there a short time, like I was. There were 28 of us that were linebacker two time frames that were there only for a few months. <clears throat> and then there were the guys who had been there for a year. And then the next POWs had been there for five years or more. Gosh. So there was, a, there was a gulf of the new guys and the old guys. You know, and I think a lot of us new guys felt like we haven't really earned these accolades. It's the old guys. You know, that's why I went, basically got my orders changed from Holloman Air Force Base to Udorn Thailand because I wanted to go to Southeast Asia in the war. And uh, so uh, it was it was a time to work through things. I mean, I couldn't as a young officer, hoping to continue flying, maybe in the front seat, I didn't want to go say to anyone that, yeah, maybe I'm, you know, got some problems I got to work through. Uh, I didn't feel like I had gotten any problems from being a POW. But as I look back now in retrospect, it was the previous eight months of combat that we talked about earlier. It was sometimes you were just, you know, It was like a machine. You were just going, you're doing, flying, you know, getting scared or not scared or, you know. <laughs> I think a common expression was, wow, I didn't know we could do it that way. <laughs> There's a lot of creativity guys were going on. <clears throat> you know, learning about, you know, different flight lead techniques that guys had, and, you know, how many times can, you know, combat mess up your day when nothing goes right. Uh, I think that probably impacted me the most. But coming home, it was this huge groundswell. And, yay! And yet, I had been there long enough, uh, or I'd been there short enough time, where I was in the meat of all the anti-military revolutions and stuff. You know, 
May of 69, I was still a cadet when they had uh, you know, the Ohio, what was it, Kent State shooting. Oh. And, and it was, you know, soldiers getting beaten up everywhere. And, and uh, I don't know. I, it was... Yeah, it was a tough time, but it wasn't just for me as a POW coming home. It was, you know, the guys that didn't have that were coming home, and people were looking at them like, "Oh, why did you get in the military? You know, gee, when are they going to let you out?" And if you tell them, "Well, I'm going to stay in for a career," and they go, "Whoa, where are you going?" You know, right? You know what? I I, I see that now, and. Uh, even after 911 and everything, there's a whole group of people uh, in this country that cannot understand why any young man or woman would want to go in the military. And you know, wouldn't you want to get out early, <clears throat> you know, before the war start? And I'm going, the best place to be in the world is in the military when the war starts. Right. There's a statistic that I, I constantly butcher because I did recruiting for a bit, but uh, in the mid, you know, late sixties, early seventies, about half of America, over half of Americans had an immediate family member that served in the military. And today that number is somewhere around like 15%. So there's so many people that don't even want, if they can name all the branches, that's, that's a miracle, but also just, they don't have that exposure that you did or people, you know, in the sixties and seventies, where it, you know, it's like a, I mean, a grandfather, a dad, ever an uncle, someone had served, and today that's just not the not the case. Yeah. So exposure yeah. is just not there. Fortunately, you and I flying at FedEx were it was just like changing uniforms, going to the same group of people in a different job. It's funny I tell it, and it's funny I just got back from a trip last week, and you know it's like two o'clock in the morning, and I'm walking through the operations center. And I actually bumped into a guy from pilot training that I had not seen in 10 years. But every time I go there, I'm bumping into someone from a squadron from pilot training, a bunch of fighter pilots end up going. And then you're sitting there for eight, 12 hours. Uh, you know, hearing interesting stories from guys who've just done some incredible things in their lives. Once, uh, one of the a seven pilots that was capping over me the day I was shot down, he didn't know I was down there, you know. There's a guy named Bill Lincoln who was FedEx pilot with me too. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a small world. But you had after you came back, you going to pilot training and, and doing a career in the Air yeah. Force. I've seen the sense of patriotism, and, and you obviously have a passion for it. I'm kind of curious too now, like since your daughter Brittany, she's flying F-16s. She was in the 13th, correct? Or at least I know she was in Masao. And so you mentioned, the, for those listening, you mentioned the 13th, which is an F-16 squadron now. You mentioned the Triple Nickel, which is an F-16 squadron now to Aviano, so they still live on today. Uh, but how? what does that feel like as a dad when, hey, she wanted to go, one, go into the Air Force, two, became, you know, wanted to go be a pilot and then a fighter pilot, and then you're showing up like in the 13th. And man, there's got to be some, there's got to be some emotions with that, I would imagine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's complex because, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I, uh, Brittany went to a very, very fine school here in Memphis, girls' school. Uh, very, very, you know, all rounded curricula and stuff. And uh, she was looking into colleges, and I said, How about applying to the Air Force Academy? And she goes, yeah, I don't think so, Dad. You know? And I said, well, how about if uh, you know you could decide to go or not, but go ahead and apply anyway, because the experience of interfacing with your congressman and doing the applications and finding out, you know, where you stand and stuff is uh, is is worth the experience, even if you don't decide to go. And uh, she said, okay. And they scarfed her right up. And she said no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, obviously, I, you know, I said, okay. Uh, 
And she went off to a very liberal arts Boston College. Uh, not Boston College, but a Tufts University up in okay. Boston. And uh, <clears throat> she, uh, I thought maybe I was going to get a doctor or somebody like that out of this. You know, she's really, really smart. And after about two weeks there, she calls up and she goes, uh, you know, Dad, I uh, I looked into this ROTC here. I think I'm going to go ROTC. And I said, Tufts doesn't have an ROTC. Are you kidding me? You know, yeah. it's the last place. She said, yeah, but MIT does. And, you know, they, they take in all the other people that in the area that want to do it. And then I, I just, I kind of dropped the hammer on her. I said, do you know that if you had told me that two weeks ago, before you signed into college, that the Air Force would have given you a full ride? <laughs> <laughs> no. Should have been, would have been so, nice to know. But the ROTC folks gave her a full ride, or pretty near a full ride for the last three years. Nice. Yeah. So that was good. She was a cadet wing commander and a distinguished graduate. It's funny that the guy that gave her the sword at her graduation ceremony at, at Tufts was General Miley. Okay. Or Mealy, I guess it is. Yeah. Interesting, <clears throat> but uh, I, uh, you know, she woke up every morning, got up, get ready, and if you see the painting on the back wall, okay, that was drawn by a guy named Rich Klein at Holloman back in 1982. Okay, and I bought one and uh, put it up there, so she saw that, and also a, a T38 painting and. Uh, Stories of my dad, that's a P-51B recce version. My dad flew above it. And uh, so she was around it. I've got pictures of her sitting in a FedEx 727 when she's five years old, sitting in the left seat. <clears throat> uh, I don't know why she suddenly decided to do that. I mean, certainly I, it was a, it, I was very proud, obviously. And as I, I should be, and I, I was, but I think, uh, I think I did not, I didn't force her to do that. I let her go and it was okay. I, it was fine. You know, so uh, she made her choice. She, she did all right. She's doing all right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine you might, know, I got uh, a seven-year-old who's he's all about jets and things like that and wants to be a fighter pilot well that's why he, he wants to fly the viper i'm like buddy by the time you get there uh you'll be shooting those things down as drones you know it's just uh that's that's the future but well sir i really want to appreciate you taking the time today um just hearing a little bit out of your journey i know we kind of scratch that was probably the fifty thousand foot view but i always like to ask my guests before we kind of part ways you know, if you found 15, 16 year old Jocko walking down the street, is there any advice you would give him? Tell him to do something different or hey, do this instead of that? That's a hard one. Because yeah, it's, not, it's, it's often not a softball, you know. I sometimes give people a warning about this, but, you know. No, it's, 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 it's not a, I, would, I wouldn't say don't do this or go do this. Is I probably tell him, you know, something that he wouldn't listen to me because, you know, he's 16 and I'm 75. You know, it, it just, it's, uh, be a little more gentle with yourself and the people you know, maybe, just psychologically. And, and take care of your friends. They're the people that, that are most important. Uh, and no mission or no no job is worth hurting your family. That's what I'd say. Not that I was able to live up to those myself, but at least I'd say, yeah. That's sage advice, and I think a perfect way to, to, to round this out. And you're not the first person 
to highlight the fact that 15 or 16 year old you probably wouldn't listen to you. So I was like, that's, that's actually a valid point. I don't think I would have listened to me. Uh, so yeah, interesting. Well, sir, thank you very much again. I appreciate you taking the time and just sharing your story. Thanks, John. And you know what? I can call you rain, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I can tell FedEx stories too. I'm sure. I'm sure you have a few FedEx stories. Maybe oh, maybe we we'll hit stop hit record. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you can stop record. I'll tell you some. Yeah. But anyway, you got to go. And uh, thank you for your time. And, thank you. Uh, well, good luck. Thank you, sir.